I start my lecture and my presentation by first of all mentioning the name of Allah and saying in the name of Allah, the Beneficent, the Merciful, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, by praising Him and by seeking refuge with Him from the evil of our souls and from our sins. And I testify that no one deserves the worship, our worship except Him, and that no one deserves to be followed fully in everything that is religious except His Prophet and Messenger Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam. I would like to express that my sense of uh, delight and pleasure at being with you tonight and I feel very privileged that I'm in the position I am. Um, and before we go any further, I just wanted to clarify a few issues. First of all, some of the presentations we did at St. James's Park um, the home of Newcastle United Football Club. We had the same forms as you have now, the feedback forms. Some of them, I was informed just before the talk just now, some of them raised the point of why I'm wearing this dress and so that to save you writing time and the paper and everything else. I'll just explain very quickly why I'm wearing it. If we imagine a situation, if I were to come here wearing something very black, they would say, look, you know, this guy's, his whole appearance, first of all, shows that he's a Christian priest. And secondly, it shows that he, his intentions are not very nice. Probably some of you may have thought like that. Secondly, if I were to appear wearing a suit and tie, you'd say, this is a religious man and he comes like a member of parliament. <laughs> if I were to come, no offense, Martin. <laughs> if I were to come wearing a t-shirt and shorts, you would rightly say it's completely inappropriate, which I agree with you. At St. James's Park, it probably would, we could probably get, to, get away with it, but not at this venue, probably. So, second point that I want to clarify is that when normally I get introduced as uh, in inverted commas, our man from Russia, and I've mentioned it before, sometimes people think that they expect the person to look like a bear and speak with a funny accent. And of course, unfortunately, I do look like a bear, but I think I'd, my accent is not as funny, so I have to disappoint you there. So we will start, inshallah, by the will of God, by the will of Allah, and I will introduce very quickly the issue of Islam and the issue of terrorism. You know it very well, some of you, the issue of terrorism. Some of you may not know it very well. Some of the things that I will say, some of you will know about Islam. Some of the things I'm going to say, you're not going to know. So therefore, our aim, my aim, the aim of the Islamic Society and everyone else from IDC and everyone who arranged this event, our aim is always, as ever, to introduce Islam far from cultural interpretations, that's what we stress all the time, things like honor killings do not exist in Islam, far away from uh, misguided uh, opinions, because sometimes we have people who go onto Google or Wikipedia, they, of course you know that Wikipedia can be edited by anyone who has access to the internet, so therefore you know, it is not really such a source of knowledge as such. But we are in the business of facts. So if some of you like it, we are happy. If some of you don't like it, then that is the way it is. And I will do my best, like my respected brother and friend, uh, Saqib, uh, has said. I will do my best to, um, to go along that path, the path of factual information and presenting Islam as it is, not as the media would like it to be presented. And I will mention the media as well, if we have anyone from the media, uh, get ready to get some stick. Um, first of all, what is Islam? Islam is a religion of all the prophets. Some of you may not know it, but we must believe in all the prophets starting from Noah, 
whom we consider one of the greatest prophets, and going all the way down in time to Prophet Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam. May peace and blessings of Allah be upon all of them. And we must believe that they are all noble prophets of God sent to mankind with one message. That message is to worship him alone, just like we have it in the Ten Commandments, just like we have it in the Bible and other scriptures that were revealed. The first commandment, the first thing that they called to was not to associate partners, not to worship anyone else with God. That was the message of all the prophets. That's what we have in the Quran, the holy book of the Muslims. That is what we have in the traditions of our prophet Muhammad uh, والسلام, who told us that we must believe in all of those prophets. And the Quran told us if we do not believe in even one of them, including Moses, Abraham, Jesus and other great individuals, then we're not considered to be Muslims, we're not considered to be believers. That is the religion of all the prophets who came to call mankind to the worship of their creator. Since he created everything, we must worship him alone. He gave us everything, so we, deserve, we must thank him for that by worshiping no one else. That is the essence of Islam. The word Islam in Arabic comes from Aslama Yuslimu Islaman, the Arabic word, which means to submit oneself to the will of God, to the will of Allah. And that is why the word Islam is not something that men gave as a name to this religion. It was revealed by Allah, it was revealed to His Prophet, and it wasn't given to the Muslims, a Muslim is a person who submits himself or herself to the will of Allah. So that is very briefly the linguistic side of things. And Islam has come and came throughout the centuries to protect five things. Firstly, the religion of a person, religious beliefs, and the freedom to worship one God. Secondly, to protect personal wealth possessions and belongings, belongings and effects. Thirdly, to protect the honor. That is why Islam is very strict in allowing men and women to mix the same way as not allowing anyone to have sexual relations before marriage. The same way Islam protects the lineage of an individual so that each one of us can know who our father is, who our mother is, who our grandfathers and grandmothers are, and so on. So, and also Islam is there to protect the integrity, the honor, the wealth, and all of these things cannot be protected by a religion that is weak, that advocates allowing everything to happen. And I can deal with some of the misconceptions at the end. I'm sure you have some questions to ask. But I would request you, like we have been told, not to interrupt me, please, during the, when I'm in full flow, when your mobiles are fully switched off, not halfway, uh, as we have been reminded, because I will be fully switched on. So, not halfway, believe me. So, therefore, Islam, what is Islam? Many people don't have a clue about Islam. All they see is images that when they come home, they switch on the BBC, the ITV, whatever else. If they come from the States, CNN and all the rest, they just see those images. Some of them may take the brave step of going to Wikipedia and looking it up. Of course, as I said, Wikipedia can be edited. So in my view, it is a good source of information, but it's, that flaw is very major in my view. And it, you have to be very careful when you take information from Wikipedia. In any area, you can check some of the entries. Some of them have swear words because recently someone edited it. And they didn't have a time, they didn't have time to actually remove those swear words. Just try to check the biography of Dick Cheney. Um, just as an example. So some people take that brave step of going to Google it or Wikipedia it or whatever you want to call it. And they find out, they take the first 
careful steps because many people believe it's a religion of Pakistanis. Many people believe that it's a religion that advocates killing and maiming and that women are oppressed and that Islam was spread through the sword and everything else. And of course, those, are, those misconceptions are perpetuated by the media, whether they like it or not, whether they willingly or unwillingly and so on and so forth, they do it. And that is something that I promised the people of the media, if there are any, normally they don't come. Uh, if they do come, they normally get a roasting from me because the media's role is not, believe me, to twist information. The, media, the media's role, as one newspaper rightly calls itself the mirror, is supposed to be a mirror, i.e. not a twisted one. Normally when I go to the mirror, uh, like I say many times, maybe I would like to look a bit slimmer, but I don't. So my mirror has a flaw that it doesn't show me, in, and even my, way, my scales, I always tell my wife that the scales are wrong. But we can deal with that. The mirror of the media has to be in such a way that the media is actually supposed, of course there are many things that they're supposed to do that they don't do. The media is supposed to take information and give it to us, to the public, to the panta. But what happens is that they take information along the way it gets into the mince, the minsa. It gets minced, it gets added to different ingredients and we have a burger. So that burger may not necessarily taste nice, especially when we talk about Islam. I challenge the media to have one week without presenting some article or some program that misrepresents Islam. One week only out of the year. And many of the Muslims here, brothers and sisters, they know what I'm talking about. Okay, so one week, forget one month or a year. We have a problem with that misrepresentation of Islam. So it has come to the individuals like myself and many other of our respected brothers and sisters who work to try and dispel those myths because some of them, believe me, are myths perpetuated by the media. And I'm, very, I'm prepared to answer only all of your questions, hopefully, at the end when we, are, uh, when we come back after the break. But for now, Islam is a religion of peace. Many people say, how can you say that when we have that and we have that and we have other people and we have September the 11th and we have 9-11, 7-7 and so on. The answer is very simple. Just like Muhammad Ali, the great boxer who was voted the greatest sports person of the 20th century in this country. He, he embraced Islam a long time ago. And when he went to visit Ground Zero, he was asked, don't you feel ashamed that you share your religion with people like Oh, he is ill, really, I think, up as he used to be. And he turned and said to that questioner, don't you feel ashamed to share your religion with Adolf Hitler? Because Adolf Hitler used to like and used to propagate, the, they used to have the Maltese cross and so on, used to pretend that they're new Christians and so on and so forth. So we are not talking about people who misrepresent certain religions. And of course, we even up to now have so-called Christians in America who don't like black people. I don't think that's the message of Christianity, somehow. We have others who don't like white people. We have even people who pretend to be Muslims in America who say that the white person is the creation of a scientist and so on. So we're not talking about those people who misrepresent religions. We deal with fact. The fact is that Islam is a religion for anyone, from any walk of life. Just look at the fifth pillar of Islam, the Hajj, the pilgrimage. If you ever had the chance to just behold that sight of three, four million people being together from all over the world, wearing exactly the same so that no one knows if you're wealthy or poor if you come from a wealthy background or a poor background and so on and so forth 
you will understand that's why Malcolm X he started off being a member of the nation of Islam who are a black racist movement who are not part of Islam at all that's why people try to call themselves nation of Islam when they feel they're out of it he started off like that and when he performed Hajj when he went to pilgrimage he changed his views completely he said Look, it cannot be right Islam is the religion of peace why it does everything to protect the peace and tranquility of the society just look back in history something always bothers me you know when someone has a headache or they always talk about it or have a headache and I have a headache in relation to history because I studied history at school and at university in Russia and then I studied a little bit of it here in England and the problem I have is that how can it be that one of the greatest if not the greatest empire that ever existed is not mentioned at all in the books of history and the empire if you want to call it that way the empire I mean is the Islamic one why is it just think about it I have my own views I won't mention them now but if the life of the non-muslims Christians lived under the Muslims and what kind of security they had what kind of security the citizens of that Muslim state had what kind of now even I have a live example I have people who lived in some Muslim countries some some of them are I would call them bad Muslim countries I have a friend of mine maybe he was here Abdurrahim Green who used to live in Egypt for a while when he was a child and that's where his interest for Islam started he said that at 12 at night he used to walk around buying ice cream because 12 at night they still sell ice cream in Egypt good place to go if you feel very hot um, and he wouldn't feel his parents would be completely and his parents were from England they did not feel the necessity to actually look after him at that hour of the night I mean I, I have children of my own at 12 noon I wouldn't let them out unless I am with them normally the little ones especially will you go to other countries vilified by the media you go to the Gulf countries to Saudi Arabia to Kuwait to Bahrain to other countries I have a friend who used to live many friends who used to live in Saudi Arabia they say that they never used to lock their houses when they, they just would put a light and they would leave and they would come back and everything would be okay some of them when they come here they're surprised that we lock everything away and that is not an exaggeration anyone who lived in Saudi Arabia will confirm that of course not within the expat wall that normally exists between the expat community and the local population so much for integration of course but anyway anyone who knows what Islam does and Islam when implemented properly brings about peace and I will mention some of the texts that prohibit us from doing what the terrorists do what do the terrorists do normally of course terrorism is a very simple word unless it becomes defined in many different ways terrorism is to bring terror to terrorize people to bring about incredible levels of fear where people cannot go about their daily business where countries cannot function as proper countries and so on it can take different levels you can have a neighbor as your terrorist who terrorizes you you can have your sometimes unfortunately I have I have had the bad experience of a neighbor like that you can have your sometimes at school classmates terrorizing you which they call bullying and so on and of course we're not talking about that what we mean is do normally at at least society level state level terrorism 
Of course, the definition, if you notice, if you follow it, and of course, normally people don't have any concern to follow the change in the definition of terrorism, unless you are in my line of work. If you follow the change of definition in, in the word terrorism, you'll notice that it changed drastically within even 20, 30, 40 years. How did it change? Well, it used to be defined as I just said it, bringing terror and incredible levels of fear and fear of attack, fear of, uh, for, for your life and so on, from organizations or individuals that are normally not legal. Now it changed, it started being defined as anyone who represents threat to the ruling and so on, to the ruling elite or to the, I wouldn't put it that way, but to the government structures and so on. Of course, if you follow that definition of terrorism, which I believe is correct, the founding fathers of America would be classed as terrorists. Because we in Britain know all about that. They just broke away from Britain and they rebelled against the British. They had a war. They were intent on killing and maiming the British troops. Of course, that never gets mentioned because they're the founding fathers. But we have another example of how it changes over the years. Nelson Mandela, when he was arrested, and the story is very well known, he was arrested on charges of terrorism. He was convicted, he was charged and convicted of terrorism. And yet in 1993, if I remember it right, or around that time, he receives the Nobel Peace Prize. So therefore it changes. Once he was a terrorist, then he was a peacemaker. You can draw your own conclusions. We have the issue of the IRA, the Irish Republican Army, when everyone with a funny accent, not like mine, with an Irish accent, was stopped on the bus, train, plane, everywhere, and presumed guilty until proven otherwise. Of course, some people would say that the IRA have bombed their way to the parliament. An interesting fact that not many people know, that no one has been convicted for any of the bombings. Those people who were convicted, the Guildford Four, the Birmingham Six and so on, they were released later. And it was acknowledged that there was a miscarriage of justice in all of those, of those cases. No one throughout the bombing of the IRA, if we truly believe it was the IRA, no one has been convicted. That is why when we have people saying to us, we have intelligence that someone is going to do something somewhere, you can't blame the people for taking it with a pinch of salt when the 20, 30 year of bombing campaign has led the police to arrest no one who could be charged legally and not released and stay in prison. So. Why am I saying that? You might think it sounds a bit bitter and so on, but one of my jobs is to represent, because we don't have proper representation of the Muslim interests when we talk about terrorism. They bring either a person who looks like a terrorist, I don't know if they have any session behind the scenes before he goes on stage and to the interviewer to look like that, I don't know that, or a person who says something completely bonkers about Islam. We do not have anyone, to my knowledge, who would come on television, and I believe that's deliberate, who would come on television and represent the Muslims as they think, as they feel. Because the Muslims feel just like the Jews felt in pre-war Germany. And it's not an exaggeration. That's how many of people I know feel, that they've been made scapegoats. And I always mention the case of Harold Shipman. Why do I mention Dr. Harold Shipman? 
because he is the worst serial killer in Britain, in the history of Britain. The known history of Britain, he has killed more than 200 or 240 people over, the, over a span of great many years. And if you divide one, who is Harold Shipman, to the number of GPs in Britain, in England and Wales, and you divide four, who are the people supposedly who blew themselves up on the London Underground and on the bus that was not supposed to be there by one billion, four by one billion, and one by the number of the GPs. Just follow me, it's coming somewhere. It's going somewhere. You divide one by the number of the GPs in England and Wales, you get a higher percentage than if you were to divide four, the number of the suspects, because for me they're suspects, to divide it by a, a billion. So what does it mean? Some of you may be shocked to know that you're more likely to be killed by your GP than by a Muslim. That doesn't mean, of course, that next time you have an appointment, you vent your anger and say that you are very likely to kill me. Because a lecturer at Northumbria University told me that. But that is the facts. That these are the facts. Because what happened was that the Muslims, unfortunately, became, for some reason, scapegoats for something. If it's a criminal matter, there are procedures to deal with that. If you believe something was, a crime was perpetrated, there are procedures to deal in America and in Britain and everywhere else to catch the perpetrators. You cannot accuse a whole group of, ethnic group of individuals that include Arabs, Pakistanis, non-Arabs, English people, everyone else to be terrorists. And that is one of my, I feel, duties to represent that and to articulate that. But let us go back to the texts that prohibit in Islam to terrorize anyone. We have an ayah, which is translated as a verse roughly, that says in the, in the Quran, that says because of that, we prescribed upon the children of Israel. And Israel, of course, is the name of Prophet Jacob, Yaqub. The children of Israel were the 12 tribes of the Jews. Allah, God said, we prescribed upon them that whoever kills a soul, without need for exacting retribution, which is not the job of everyday individuals, it's the job of the state, or without any corruption in the land, then it is as if he has killed the whole of mankind. One individual is killed unlawfully, then it is as if he or she killed the whole of mankind. The next one is a narration, because we have hadith, which means a narration or a tradition of our Prophet Muhammad, alayhi salatu wasalam, because we have a great culture of tracing all of the statements of Prophet Muhammad back to him. That statement says, whoever kills a non-Muslim with whom the Muslims have a pact of agreement, which normally includes all the people around the world at the moment, then he will not smell, he will not feel the fragrance of paradise. We as Muslims, we believe that as a reward for our deeds and out of his mercy, Allah will grant us paradise if we are worthy of it. We do not believe that you can do your shopping at the supermarket and there is no checkout. You can just walk away and take all the goods. We believe that you must pay for your actions. So the evil people will go to the hellfire, which is the belief of the Christians and the Jews. And the good people who followed and submitted themselves to the will 
of God will go to paradise. An individual, let alone a group of people who do not respect that and go and kill unlawfully. A person who is not a Muslim, because a lot of people think that it is, we have a green light to kill non-Muslims, but we are not allowed to kill Muslims. That is incorrect. Another misconception that is developed and perpetuated by either the media or some other interested parties, I would call them. That individual or a group of individuals will not smell the fragrance of paradise. What does it mean? It means not only will not he enter paradise, but he will not even smell its smell. And its smell is smelled, we find in another narration, at a distance of 70 years. So some of you may say, how is it possible to smell anything at a distance of 70 centimeters, let alone 70 years? The Wright brothers, when they started flying, or let's go back even more, Leonardo da Vinci. When he said a man can fly, they said, you're mad. Birds fly. Men walk. Now, of course, we all fly. We're trying to stop it because we are told it pollutes everything. But we do fly, not ourselves, but there are flying machines. So we have those two pieces of evidence. Furthermore, in a state of war, when the Muslims are fighting, some people believe Muslims should not have a right to defend themselves. It's probably a personal belief that is not backed up by any international agreements. It is sometimes expressed privately by some individuals. The Muslims in the state of war are not allowed to kill civilians not engaged in warfare. They do not need the Geneva Convention that no one adheres to. It's just there to shove it down the throats of weaker nations as far as I'm concerned. They do not need the Geneva Convention. They have it since now, we're in the year 1429, according to the Islamic calendar. That is after the flight, the migration of Prophet Muhammad from Mecca to Medina. For that long, for 1400 years, we have had this law of not killing individuals, civilians, old people, monks, specifically mentioned, monks who are worshipping God. We believe that they worship Jesus, which we are not allowed to do, we are not allowed to touch them. Let alone children, women and so on. Men that are not engaged in warfare, you're not allowed to do that. Some people don't know that. It is my job to say it. Also, a prisoner of war, as I said, I mentioned the Geneva Convention, which is very easy to overcome by just changing the wording. Like someone very clever, he thought, invented the word unlawful combatant. So you don't have to respect anything if you just change the wording. We don't have that in Islam. A prisoner of war remains a prisoner of war until proven otherwise. If he's captured in war, whether you call him a centre-half for Newcastle United or an unlawful combatant, it doesn't change anything in our religion. He remains what he is, or she is, in that, for that matter. So we have the rights of prisoners of war who must be treated better than the normal individuals. They must be fed very well. They must be looked after very well. Which doesn't mean we allow them to kill us. That's a different matter. These are rules of war. Once I was doing a stall in Leicester City Center and someone, one English gentleman, came to me and said, and that's probably something he had prepared earlier, as they say, 
And he said, look, this verse in this chapter, it says, kill the disbelievers and be harsh against them. How do you explain that? I said, very easy, in a state of war. Who normally fights the Muslims? Normally not the Muslims. When the disbelievers fight the Muslims, we're supposed to be harsh. We're not supposed to be, excuse me, can I hit you that way? If you don't mind. Everyone knows that. You know, realities of war are concealed from the public normally. That's why they have a problem with Al Jazeera. Even though I don't endorse Al Jazeera, I believe they're just like CNN and everyone else in the business of mincing the truth. But some people, they have an issue with the Al Jazeera. They say it shows too much gross, these effects of the war and blood and everything. That's what war is about. It's not about a computer game that you play and then you can go home. The reality, realities of war are very grim. That is why with the death of the people who took part in the Second World War in this country and elsewhere, those realities are very, very distant for people. They do not understand what war is. We find that they are worried about Wayne Rooney's foot more than 500 people being killed in one day sometimes. Who cares about Wayne Rooney's foot except some... Okay, maybe lots of people care, I apologize. <laughs> but I mean, in the, in the scale of things, what is it? Nothing. But that's how the media works. That's how the world works. When football players are sometimes shown on TV more than the prime minister. But we do not treat things like that. We must not treat things like that in Islam. In addition to what I have said, when we have agreements with Muslim states and non-Muslim states, when you have a visa upon entering a country like Britain, the UK, you have a visa. That visa means that you will adhere to the rules and the laws of the land. That stands firm. No Muslim under any circumstances is allowed to violate that agreement. We have another hadith that says al muslimuna ala shurutihim, which means that the Muslims must stick to their agreements. And anyone who analyzes the life of Prophet Muhammad and I'm ready to answer any questions you may have about him, who analyzes his life, and of course there are not many people who have done that, including the people in Denmark, Anyone who analyzes his life will know his utmost respect for his agreements to the extent that some of his companions were being tortured and killed, but he did not break the agreements due to that. So for people to come and say just because a couple of Muslims are illegal immigrants or whatever else that may be, and look at these guys, they're constantly breaking the law, I would say would you judge the British public by the football fans? It would be great injustice. Someone might see a drunk someone supporter somewhere in Europe or around the world and say, look, this is how people are in Britain. Some German person who is probably mentally unstable attacked the Pope. Maybe you remember a few months ago or something like that. Everyone said, you know, German people are not like that. Which is true, because everyone else stood still. No one attacked the Pope, just that individual. How come is it that when we have someone who may be of a Muslim faith, of an Islamic faith, he or she, when they do something, it applies straight away to, to Islam, let alone to the Muslims? This is completely incorrect. Such generalizations have been used throughout history to get rid of undesirable people. So therefore, it is incorrect. Something else that deals with the issue of terrorism and bringing terror. 
Not many of you may know that in Islam, in a state of war, not in a state of peace, because we are talking about state of peace, terrorism occurs in times of peace, not in times of war. In times of war, they're called soldiers, the terrorists, because they bring terror. In times of peace, a Muslim is not allowed to cut a tree unnecessarily. In times of peace, a Muslim is not allowed to cut grass unnecessarily. What is grass? Some of you would say, well, why is it so significant? But to that extent, how can anyone attribute Islam to violence? They will say sometimes that look at these individuals who post videos on, the, on YouTube. I can post a video on YouTube. You can post a video of, on YouTube. You can film me today talking, put another something behind me, and put a video on YouTube, me threatening someone. That's number one. Number two, even if there are such people who do it, like I said before, they do not represent Islam. Two or three individuals, even a hundred people, do not represent Islam. Even a million people, if they were to do something against Islam and say that this is what Islam says, that would not represent Islam. We need to go to the sources of Islam and understand them correctly and study them, not Google them and Wikipedia them. That is not sufficient. Many of you are students at this university and other places of higher education. You know very well that you cannot study something for 10 minutes and then be an expert on it. And of course we have that on TV. How many experts you know that we as Muslims, when we see them on BBC even, BBC of course they pride themselves, they don't say anything wrong. BBC, ITV, anyone else? Or you, of course, not to mention the tabloids. How many of those so-called experts you see who completely talk bonkers about Islam? And you think, what kind of an expert is this? If he were in court, he would be completely discredited. If I were a lawyer, it would take me two minutes to discredit that individual. That is what I mean. I call everyone present here. If you want to know something about Islam, please go and read it. Talk to individuals who are well versed in that religion. Don't stop someone in the street and say, excuse me, what's your name? Mr. Muhammad? Okay, what do you think of this? What does he think? Nothing. He's just going to the local takeaway or to the corner shop. What can he think? He even forgot to think until you reminded him. That's what they do. Oh yeah, we have 70% of people agreeing, disagreeing. What is 70% of those you requested the pool? How many people did you ask? That is not representative of anything. And people use those figures to manipulate figures, to manipulate anything, public opinion. How many people who were against public opinion and they were right? I, I just mentioned Leonardo da Vinci, the Wright brothers. Anyone who invents anything new, the public opinion is generally against him. Someone now, people are talking about space travel. Of course, some people believe that it's possible. Some people believe it's not possible for a general Joe public to go to space and see the moon and everything else and pay, I don't know, a couple of thousand pounds and come back. Because it's extremely ex expensive. Maybe we can meet in about 20, 30 years time when I'm a bit older and we can talk about space travel. But the public opinion is something that's against it. That is why we should not go by the public opinion. When we judge Islam and the Muslims, their actions must be judged against the sources of Islam. The Quran in its correct interpretation and the Sunnah, which is the, the body of evidence and narrations from Prophet Muhammad 
There are many other examples of our religion forbidding terrorism. There is no even need to mention that. All the Muslims know it. Almost all the Muslims know it. But here I am reminding some of you and maybe educating some of you. There is a narration or a tradition which we call in Arabic hadith that mentions that a woman from Banu Israel, the children of Israel, she was granted paradise because, and she was a prostitute. So she was a sinful woman in the eyes of God. She was granted paradise because she gave a thirsty dog a drink of water with her shoe. Of course, that does not mean she stopped being a prostitute. She was forgiven on account of that. We are all encouraged as Muslims hundreds of years before the RSPCA to be kind to animals. We are told not to sharpen the knife when we want to slaughter an animal in front of the animal. Why? Because it says you will slaughter it twice. First psychologically, then in reality. So do you think a religion that tells us not to, not to offend a sheep is going to tell us go and bomb without any aim? Do you really believe that? Go and destroy innocent people, children, the tragedy of Beslan in the south of Russia where I come from? Do you believe that our religion would tell anyone to do that? I don't think so. We have many other texts in the Quran, places in the Quran and in the narrations of our Prophet in which we are told to be good to our neighbors, to be good to our non-Muslim neighbors, to be considerate. When we cook something, to make it large, make the pot large, so that the neighbor can get some of it. How many of us do that? Probably make it small so they can't get anything. Of course, people will say that that is also in Christianity. And generally, people would not accuse Christianity, rightly so, of being a terrorist religion. That is very true. Love thy neighbor. Because there are people who claim that they're so-called Christian fundamentalists, or they have been probably labeled, because we have many labels. There's a label room probably somewhere where people get labeled. And Christian fundamentalists themselves would probably say that, you know, Christianity does not tell us to do that. But people get labeled. We are not saying that Muslims are all good guys. Far from it. But what I am saying is that you cannot judge the religion. You cannot judge anything. You cannot judge Northumbria University by just the booklet. That's why we, when we want to enroll on a course, we come to the open day. We want to talk to the teachers. We want to talk to the lecturers. You cannot judge Newcastle by its football team. It's much better. We will hope that it will improve the image of the city. And you, can do, you, cannot judge, you cannot judge anything by just, even some people say, by first impressions. So that is why I believe, due to its importance, the topic of Islam and terrorism cannot be judged on its surface. It cannot be judged knowing the history of the media and the tendency of influential governments, individuals and organizations to use the media in their aims or to achieve their aims 
You cannot judge anyone by the media. It is very difficult to do. Because they draw the conclusion for you. But the job of the media should be to give us the information so that we can draw our conclusions. Otherwise, it's not the mirror. Otherwise, they are not doing their job. And that is, of course, something that may never change, but that is something to bear in mind, that an individual must be thinking independently, questioning things, questioning how can some people say, I will give you this, I, will, I, will, I don't pretend that I know everything, but how can two massive buildings, 100 stories high, collapse in nine seconds? Have you ever thought about that? But we are given that it was just a fire and it broke and everything collapsed. How can a bus that never goes through Tavistock Square, I was in Tavistock Square, I went through every bus stop. People probably thought I was lost. I was looking at the bus numbers. Bus number 30 never goes through Tavistock Square, but that's a different issue. What I'm giving you is that you must think independently. My final probably thought, since we're drawing to a conclusion of the talk, and my final request to everyone is you owe it to yourself to, to be independent. You owe it to yourself not to follow someone else's opinion. You are an individual. You're an amazing creation. That is why we have the Guinness Book of Records, because people can do amazing things. Some of them are stupid, of course. But, like, who can eat more sausages? But people can do amazing things. That is why you, as a human being, why should you agree that someone programs you? Why should you accept that someone leads you astray just because they claim that they are leading you to the right path? I believe that you as an individual, as a free human being, you owe it to yourself to know the truth. Because all people claim that they are upon the truth. But it's up to you to see who really is and who really isn't. That is why I conclude my lecture by saying that Islam is a religion of peace and you owe it to yourself to find it out. Thank you very much. What is unlawful or lawful in reference to warfare in Islam? What is allowed or not allowed? Generally, warfare, when we say warfare in Islam, it means something that is declared or announced or taken, undertaken on the state level. So it's not up to any group to declare that they're uh, an army of someone or whatever else. Generally, it is that decision is taken uh, on the level of the government of the Islamic State. So lawful and unlawful is decided by the scholars of Islam and uh, if they deem it to be lawful, then they may engage. If unlawful, they will not engage. Uh, generally, that goes back to the religious principles of Islam. So, for example, if, uh, if uh, the group of scholars that the, the government generally needs to be uh, to seek advice from, if they deem that, that uh, the war that is being proposed is unlawful, then, for example, violates the rights and the agreements uh, that have been uh, signed with different states, then of course they will not go ahead with it. And uh, there is no, uh, generally, and that's something I refer you back to history, there's no manipulation uh, of, different, of different kinds and sorts, as it happened with the Iraq war and every other war that generally happens. There's a lot of manipulation and behind the scenes uh, activity that goes on normally. Some say that newspapers pander to their readers' prejudices. If this is indeed the case, is the misconception of Islam to do with the media truly 
or simply the arrogance of the public? Well, it could do with the, probably the arrogance of the public or personal misconceptions, but when we have an individual who is being introduced as a, an expert in some field, I mean, I don't know about you, I, I, I'm sure that you agree with me that he should not come with his prejudices. For example, if someone is called to testify in a court of law regarding something that, for example, happens in physics or chemistry, or any other field for that matter, and he or she says, actually, you know, I think that, you know, what that scientist said is not really valid, the judge is going to interrupt him and everyone else to just state the facts not to state your opinion. So that applies to Islam, much, much more than to uh, any individual case that we may have, because we are talking about a religion, the followers of which number more than a billion people. And it's not about numbers. I'm not, I'm not emphasizing it so that the more numbers we have, the, the more guided we are. That's not how we view things in Islam. But the scales are big, and the stakes are big. So. We cannot expect someone to come on television and spur out his or his or her, you know, prejudices or whatever they may have. You know, we expect factual information. What's the concept of being awarded 70 or something like that virgins in heaven if you do jihad or get martyred in the name of God? Is it really necessary to be awarded like that by um, any incentives? Yes, king of one person, any race religion is king of all mankind as you refer to. Okay, is that the comment, the last thing? Yeah, the last thing. Okay. Okay, the question was, is it necessary to be rewarded or promised 70 virgins for being a martyr? First of all, the issue of martyrdom exists in every religion, to my knowledge. It exists in Christianity, in Judaism and other religions. And the martyr is someone who dies in the cause of that religion normally. We consider a martyr to be someone who dies, one of the martyrs, because we have many martyrs, a woman who dies during, during childbirth is considered to be a martyr. But one of the highest degrees of martyrdom in Islam is a person who gives his life, because that is the ultimate thing that can be given in this world. His or her life in the path of uh, servitude of God and on the battlefield. Where the 70 virgins comes from, I don't know, but the martyrs are promised great rewards. The believers are promised that they will have virgin wives in paradise. So that is what God promised, Allah promised to the believing men to have as reward. And we do not conceal anything. Islam is an open religion because anyone who conceals normally anything in secret societies or anything else, that normally means it's not really something that people are likely to follow. So that is why, or there may be other reasons, but generally Islam is an open religion. We say that women are promised that they will live with their husbands in paradise if both of them are Muslims and they follow the religion of Islam. But this is, this is what we are promised. I don't know that about martyrs. Martyrs who really did die sincerely for the cause of God, they get the privilege of interceding in, before God on the day of judgment for many of their relatives. So that is one of the privileges that that person gets. And of course, that is how God rewards his pious servants. With reference to 9-11, can you explain why committing suicide or suicidal uh, can take you to paradise. Please define the concept of jihad. It's a whole lecture. The concept of jihad has been misrepresented grossly. That word has been taken to mean anything other than everything that it does not mean. Jihad in the Arabic language means to, the linguistic meaning means to exert effort in achieving a goal. Jihad in the specific sense of warfare means to to protect the Muslims, their religion, their possessions, their lives, as well as non-Muslims, including Jews and Christians, who may be under the protection of the Islamic State, who are not required to join the Muslim army. Now, I want to make that very clear. The people who live under the protection of the Muslim State, who are called Ahlul Dhimma, the people of the protection, the people who live in that state, they are not required whatsoever to contribute to the army 
in terms of their servitude. Jihad means to implement that, to protect it. That is the right of every state, every individual, to the right to self-defense and uh, the right to pursue legitimate aims. So that is why we say that jihad has been misrepresented. You know, there's no, there is no almost media, as I say, because some people have an issue with that. I don't mind if they have an issue with that because I have an issue with the media. Every time they come and they use jihad is always in the negative context. That's how people get conditioned. Any one of you who studies psychology or anything like that, that's how people get conditioned. That is why when you have a football team who are constantly losing, no reference to anyone, they need to get out of that cycle. They need to know psychologically that they can win. I'm not referring to England or anyone else, but or Newcastle United, but I mean that that is psychological conditioning. When every day, day in, day out, you get told that jihad means this, people believe it. They don't have the, sometimes the bravery to go and check it. You know, some people are afraid that they will discover the truth. They will discover that Islam is good. Some people are afraid of that. They are afraid that their misconceptions will be broken. But jihad doesn't mean that. Yes. What can Britain, I include British Muslims and non-Muslims, do to challenge the negative interpretation of Islam? First of all, it depends if the person doesn't want to challenge it, of course he's not going to do anything. And secondly, if the person does want to challenge that negative interpretation, and like I said in the lecture, if you want to seek the truth, then you owe it to yourself. You know, you can't live in an imaginary world. That's why people are very keen on one side of the world we have Hollywood, on the other Bollywood. And both of them are pumping us with imaginary worlds. One world is that, one world is that. So when we switch off the video, which uh, we find ourselves in the reality. Sometimes it's scary. You know, people, we were just living in the world of romance and love and songs and dance and everything else. I still can't understand how 500 people can dance together. But anyway, that probably takes years of practice. But people live in a, in a, in a world of imagination. Islam is a religion of reality. That's why many people find it very gross, if I can use that word, when they learn some of the aspects of Islam. Why should private parts be mentioned? Why should that be mentioned? Because Islam is the religion of reality. It doesn't live in a hypocritical word, world of imagination. That is why anyone who wants to know the truth, he or she will go and find out the truth. It's very easy to do. It doesn't take any money at all. It is free generally, but it, it helps if you can travel, if you can see the world. And uh, that's how I believe. I believe that Muslims can and have done much more against terrorism than many, many politicians. That's my firm belief. Because polit many politicians, they do their best to breed more terrorists. And that is, that is not my belief, that is the reality. If you kill someone's father, who do you think they're going to love you? Just imagine yourself, someone came and killed and humiliated before killing, humiliated your father, your mother, your, someone you love. Are you going to be the, the, a friend of that individual for the rest of your life? Or are you going to swear that you're going to do something? And I'm not saying that people should do anything. I'm just saying that if that happens, what do you think is going to happen? Ask anyone who's even in the course of their everyday life, someone lost a, a loved one through an accident or through, through a murder. How do they feel towards that murderer? That's all I want to say, because people who murder breed more terrorism. I'm, sorry, I'm not sorry to say that. That's just reality. So if you think that we who are preaching that, who are preaching the true Islam, are breeding terrorism, that's, that's very, first of all, very sad that the person wants to remain ignorant. And secondly, it's completely wrong. So a person who wants to dispel that and he wants to learn the truth, he or she, they can do it very easily. And that's how we can contribute to the society. Because the Muslims, we must contribute to this society. And they do. 
not only by words, but by everything else, by taxes, by reducing crime rates. And I can back it up with figures. Because if you instill the fear of God into the hearts of men and women before the fear of the police, because the police can't, unlike some films who say that it's possible to predict a murder before it happens, the police can't predict that. They only come to record it normally. Someone has been killed, he was found there. That's it, let's investigate. Because that's all they can do. At least that's what they say. But what I'm saying is that prevention is better than cure. We all know that. That's what our religion propagates. And that is very well seen in many, many countries, in many areas, the Muslim area. Some people were talking about the notion, no go Muslim area. There's no such, no, there's no such area. This is a, you know, one of the things that some people do to stir a debate, so-called. There's a no-go area. Show me, I come from Leicester. There is a 60,000 Muslim population in, in Leicestershire. There is no no-go Muslim area. There is no such area. But what happens is that when Muslims move in, generally the local population do not want to live with the Muslims. They move out. So what are we supposed to do? Use super glue? I mean, what is integration? Because that brings the whole thing of integration, multiculturalism. In, in the 70s, Leicester City Council used to place adverts in Uganda when Idi Amin was kicking out all the, driving out all the Asians. They, were placed, they placed an advert saying in the main newspaper in Uganda, saying, do not come to Leicester. We don't have any places for you. And it's a very hard life. Don't believe the stories. Now, when you get off the train station at Leicester, it says multicultural city. It's amazing how things can change. Islam doesn't change. For 1400 years, we've been advocating that a black person is like a white person. We don't have seasonal changes. It's in fashion that black people are better. It's in fashion that white people now are better. We don't have that. We have these principles that I've just told you for 1400, over 1400 years. And just analyze, try to find, it's very difficult sometimes, try to find some bits of history that will show you that. You know, people talk about the penal system in Islam. Read how many times it was used. Read how many people committed fornication, how many people were unfaithful to their husbands or to their wives. It is mostly for prevention. Read how many people used to steal and still do in Muslim countries and Muslim areas even. Why is it that it happens? That's something for you to answer. Because that means the person fears God before the police. Some people say in New York and everywhere else, they call it the criminal capital of the world. I've been to New York. In 1990, I went there. They told us, don't come out after seven. Because you can be killed, raped, or something else. Doesn't matter whether you're a man or woman. Anything that moves gets killed. I mean, what's, what's that? Especially in the city center. They said it to us straight. So people are asking sometimes, how come you're saying that, I mean, this is a completely different debate, but the penal system of Islam works and the one that is in America doesn't work. It's very simple because you do not put the fear of God in the hearts of people. Because you are letting them know that if they get a good lawyer, Mr. Loophole, he can get away with it. I mean, I heard some guy here challenged when he was stopped for speeding. I won't mention his name. The, his lawyer, his solicitor challenged the measurement of a mile. He was doing 90 MPH on the motorway, not in the city. And they said, let us challenge the mile. Because the mile is not really defined properly in Britain. You know, some people, they say the mile is these many yards, and others, they say these many yards. According to the second one, he was actually doing 70 miles per hour. So if you know that you can get Mr. Loophole like that, you can do 100 if you want. I'm not advocating that, so that no one misquotes me and I get into trouble.
I think, first of all, we have to understand what he wanted to say, what he meant, before we go off and... Because today I was listening to the radio in the car and someone was going off saying, how can he make such a comment and he's advocating that honor killings must be implemented. I mean, they, 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 that's what... He never meant that. First of all, we must be just to the individual concerned. What did he say? And then we make a comment on that. So I, I didn't hear it myself. If he meant that parts of Sharia law are implemented or will be implemented in, in Britain, that's already happening. We have interest-free accounts. HSBC offer a mana trust where you can, according to their claim, you can have interest-free banking. Who amongst us wouldn't like an interest-free loan? I don't see any hands. Interest-free loan, all of us would like an interest-free loan. That's what Islamic Sharia advocates because it tells us that to charge people for borrowing money is unjust. That's just one aspect of our religion. So if that's what he meant, but, I mean, people are going to come and say, oh, do you mean that we are actually, uh, we force people to wear, I mean, we, who are we, first of all? We have to be very careful. We believe that the woman must cover her beauty. Otherwise, you, it will probably also be good for the environment, because so many whistles you get from builders, I mean, I'm sure that must affect something. And I don't know, I can't even do it. I haven't practiced for a while. <laughs> so, of course, uh, that's what we believe. But I mean, I don't think that the Archbishop meant that he's, after all, Archbishop of Canterbury. I mean, we have to understand his position. So, if he meant that parts of the Sharia law will be implemented, I believe that if, it, if they are, and some of them are being implemented, not only for the Muslims, because even the Islamic Bank of Britain have, have an obligation to, to serve non-Muslim customers. Of course. Why not? I mean, it's only for the better, I think. But proper Islamic... Because some people were making today, again, comments, the Islamic fundamentalists will be just happy. I mean, what is that about? Who are they? The guys from the cave who made the two towers collapse? What, by remote control or something? I mean, we have to be adults when we have discussions like that. We can't be like the parliament, I'm sorry to say that, who are booing. I mean, what's that about? You know, they don't allow a person to finish the speech. I know why Tony Blair is a very determined individual now, because in order for you to finish a speech, you need to be very determined in parliament. Because there's lots, all sorts of noise coming from everywhere. So therefore, we have to be adults, we have to discuss it properly. And I don't think that the Archbishop of Canterbury meant that at all. I think what he meant was that it's inevitably stating a fact that some forms and some things and aspects of the Sharia law may be implemented or will be implemented. And I agree with him. Uh, please, can you speak about the status of women in Islam? Um, and what is the standing of Sharia on women's rights? The status of women in Islam, it's a very high status. The rights of women in Islam, they have every right that they need. Some people claim that Muslim women are forced to be Muslim. Of course, I don't, I can, we can ask all the Muslim sisters we have here. And also there is a claim that they are forced by their husbands who are very harsh to them. And I mean, that is completely wrong and couldn't be further from the truth. How do you explain that mostly young women in Russia embrace Islam? How do you explain that? If they don't have any rights, if they're, for, if they're foregoing the so-called liberty to be naked, or the liberty to uncover your body in front of other men, for the oppression of the covering. How can you explain that? You can't. If you believe that they are oppressed, 
Wasn't it so long ago when the Christian lady was supposed to be covered? Aren't the best respected and most respected women in Christianity the nuns? They are. Tell me the difference between a nun's costume and a Muslim woman's costume. There isn't much of a difference. So what kind of right? What to right to do what? That's how I always ask. You know, like with integration. What do you mean by that? Integration. What is the woman's rights? Do they have a right to possess property long before she, she was given it in Europe? Long before. Does she have a right to divorce her husband? Yes. The, Christ, the Catholic Church still doesn't allow that, to my knowledge, unless they change something. That's why the Church of England came about. Because the king wanted to divorce his wife. And the Pope said, no way. Of course, this is the men's rights now. Men have rights too. Don't be sad. The women have all the rights they need. What right? To possess, they have the right to buy, they have the right to... But within the Sharia law. So they don't have a right to go and go with another man. Which man, believe me, likes to do that? That his wife goes off somewhere. They don't have the right to not to take care of their children because that is a responsibility. And the men generally are required in Islam, there's some more good news for women. We are required to go out and be the breadwinners. She is not required at all to work, believe, believe it or not. She can stay at home if she wants. Is she allowed to work? Of course she is. But she doesn't have to. What a nice position to be in. Imagine you wake up and say, yeah, finally, I don't have to go to work. Some of us dream about that. So what kind of rights do we mean? She has every right, in my view, that every possible, reasonable right that she can have, she has it. And that's been guaranteed so many centuries ago. When there were discussions going on in some parts of the world about the, the woman, is she really human or not? They were. Because she could be the devil. But all that time ago she was guaranteed that. There was a case where it was brought in front of our Prophet Muhammad. A woman said, look, I don't like my husband. I just don't like, he's a good man. I don't have any problem with him being good. He's of good character. I just don't like his face. Which of course can happen. Faces change. So she was relieved of her husband. Do you think that husband didn't have any feelings for her? Of course you do. She has that right. She's not forced to remain in a marriage what she doesn't like. But the marriage is not made a, a toy where people play with it. Because that affects children, that affects society. That's my answer. Okay, have you read the World Political Almanac? It lists the, it lists the major terrorist incidents since 1948 by all groups. The question is, when a Christian, Hindu, Jew, etc. commits an act of terrorism, why is the religion not mentioned? I mean, it's uh, something that most, if not all Muslims notice, that whenever there is something they say, it is possible it's Islamic terrorists. Um, when, of course, it's another religion or nation or something like that, they don't say it could be the Hindu terrorists or the Christian terrorists or something like that. There's something that probably is very familiar to the Irish people throughout the 70s and the 80s and maybe even some of the 90s when they were called the Irish terrorists. And, of course, it was very offensive to every Irish person who was not involved in any, which is the vast majority of the Irish people, very good people. They're not, they were not involved in any... Uh, terrorist activity whatsoever, but they were labeled the Irish terrorists. 
It's just like I said, there's a labeling room in every news editor's place and they label people, they label organizations, sometimes fairly, sometimes unfairly. I believe in this case it's unfair because the fact that they are Muslims doesn't mean that they are, that they are Islamic terrorists. There is a question about suicide bombings. Um, the question is why you have not explicitly condemned suicide bombing um, and according to this most Muslim scholars have condemned it. As far as I'm concerned, concerned suicide bombings, if we can call them like that, are not permissible and that is something that's correctly stated in the comment, in the question, that it is not permissible to be perpetrated against civilians uh, it is not permissible to be perpetrated against women and children who are having a pizza in Pizza Hut. That is not jihad, that is not warfare. And if neighbor John takes something from you, you don't go and punish neighbor Matthew for that. That is completely illogical. So that is logically and Islamically and even militarily, it doesn't make sense. So therefore, there are people who want to do things, there are people who want to justify things. That's a completely different issue. We in our religion are told that anyone who kills himself will do so in the hellfire, meaning killing himself exactly the way he killed himself in the world for a very long time. So therefore, we do not approve of it. Uh, all the normal major scholars condemned it long, long before Osama bin Laden was known to the West, long before that, Osama bin Laden himself was written to by many scholars in Saudi Arabia and other countries, which of course is not highlighted almost anywhere unless you come to a lecture like this. But Osama bin Laden was known to the Islamic scholars long before he was known to the Western public. I wouldn't say to the Western agencies because that's not the case, but to the Western public. So that is why suicide bombings are a lot. I'm not co connecting Osama bin Laden with suicide bombings. I'm just giving an example. Because if you go to the FBI website, just a point to mention, I don't go there often. Sometimes I check it for the most wanted. <laughs> uh, if you go there, the 10 most wanted, nine of them are drug dealers with uh, Spanish or Latin American connections. Uh, generally Spanish names and so on. And of course, number one, Osama bin Laden. If you look at the list of crimes he's wanted for, 9-11 is not one of them. And I find that very peculiar. And uh, it doesn't have direct relation to the question, but I just think that with the FBI acknowledging that they don't have sufficient evidence to charge him for that, it's, you know, food for thought. How can we contribute to um, helping the injustices in the Muslim world and disadvantaged third world uh, countries to change? Uh, today's lecture is to present Islam and to present its stance on terrorism. But just to quickly answer the question, I mean, it's a very complex issue. You can't just solve it overnight. I don't believe it will be solved within the next hundred years. But it's a long-term view. We must all return back to the teachings of the of the of true Islam and to implement them so that we are just with people, so that we do not wrong anyone, so that we understand issues correctly, not based on emotions. And then of course, if we do that and we wait patiently, there may be a change. Um, from all that you have told us. Would you say it would be better to educate the Muslims first? Some Muslims are the ones propagating such ideas of terrorism. Yes, of course, uh, we must not forget the Muslims, the Muslim youth and the non-Muslims as well. Uh, we do a lot of work, I myself included, in propagating the, the, and teaching the correct Islam. Um, but I do not buy the notion that was floated after 7-7 July 7th bombings in London, that all of the Muslim youth and all of the mosques around Britain are propagating terrorism and things like that. That is completely wrong. I do not know of, I, I used to know of one mosque that was leaning towards that. I once had the, uh, the, the unfortunate uh, chance to pray there. That was Finsbury Park Mosque, uh, the way Abu Hamza used to preach before. Uh, I had a very nasty feeling when I prayed there. 
But that mosque, as far as I know now, has been changed. The whole structure, uh, the management structure and everyone else has changed. That is not the rule, believe me. For those of you who have not been to a mosque, that is not the rule. So, of course, we must educate, I believe, but there is a problem, I believe, in the Asian and Somali and other communities where they do not have a good link with the youth. And that sometimes is down to the language barrier, sometimes it's down to some other barriers. But I do not believe that the Muslims need to be told, do not go and bomb somewhere. But we do need to emphasize the issue of understanding. I believe we must emphasize more also to Muslims and non-Muslims alike the benefits of the mixing between the communities because a lot of non-Muslims, English or otherwise, they do not have the inclination to mix at all. Then they say that we don't integrate. And of course that happens also on the other side. Sometimes the Asian community, the Pakistani community, the Indian community we have in Leicester, a very large Indian community, they do not sometimes, in my view, uh, come forward they're too closed within themselves. I believe it doesn't mean that you know we should should be like Michael Jackson, try to change our uh, try to change the skin of the color of our skin and integrate. I do not mean that, but I mean, and of course after that he sings. Doesn't matter what color you are, but <laughs> apparently it does. So I mean that uh, the people need education from both sides. But uh, I believe that uh, if we have more events like these, and if we have such, uh, you know, such nice audiences like you have been a great audience, I thank you for that very much. If we have people willing to listen, willing to understand, then I believe we can change it. It's not an idealistic view. It's a view, I believe, is, which is realistic. And a lot of people do not know a lot about Islam. A lot of Muslims may be also pleasantly surprised when they go out of their no-go-out areas, um, which some of them unfortunately do, they don't go out much to the other areas and they don't mix, generally the elderly population, they probably have mixed enough. But I believe that the, the general thrust of the work that is being done by many people, which is to educate, and I challenge, which I have done many times when I came to, to St. James's Park, I challenged the BBC to give me 9 o'clock, 9 p.m. slot at any weekday or weekend for one hour. I challenged them to give me that. They won't do it as far as I know. ITV, Channel 4, anyone. I challenged them to give it to me or anyone else who propagates proper Islam, which unfortunately has not been done at all. They give normally the, the, the floor to anyone who says things that, like I said, do not have any relation or very completely distant and wrong relation to Islam and they misinterpret it. I believe that the, the media have a job to do. Uh, you know, the whole of the society have a job to do and if we all do our part, we can coexist and live very peacefully as we have done for many, many a year. And I thank you very much. I thank the Islamic Society and I thank Martin and everyone else for reminding people to be, to be fully switched on unlike the microphone <laughs> and the mobiles fully switched off and thank you very much for your time and I hope I will see you again.